Welcome into yet another Trends and Reactions video. This time looking forward to week 15, which is probably your second week of the fantasy playoffs. If you're watching this, that means you probably won. So congratulations. Let's go get that fantasy championship. And before we get into the week's trends, I want to quick remind you to click that subscribe button like the video if you found it useful and if you have any questions leave them in the comments this is a video meant to quickly analyze last week's action to find out some future trends from every game I'm talking hard hitting quick analysis to help you digest the week's action so without further ado let's get into it starting with the thursday night game the patriots versus the rams cam Akers now has a stranglehold over the rams backfield He's essentially playing the 2017 Todd Gurley role with almost 90% of the snaps and about 90% of the touches. I hope you have him for your fantasy playoffs, but if you don't, Akers should probably be remembered as a top draft pick in 2021. Titans versus the Jaguars. Last week, I thought Ryan Tannehill could support multiple receivers, specifically A.J. Brown and Corey Davis, in a Derrick Henry-centric offense. I also said that Henry looked tired. Well, he was not tired in this one. My goodness. Derrick Henry has a cake schedule coming up, Detroit and Green Bay, uh, which are particularly favorable for running backs. Maybe, I guess, the lesson from this past game against the Jaguars is that Tennessee can only support multiple wide receivers in games where the, tennis, the Titans don't dominate on the ground which seems likely in week 15 against the Lions. And they'll probably run up the score, especially if Matthew Stafford misses time. So maybe Davis is on the cutoff to, to playable. Vikings versus the Buccaneers. You know, I'm not really sure that Bruce Arians meshes with Tom Brady. Brady makes some good throws, but many look uncomfortable. It didn't cost him the game this week because Dan Bailey missed every kick he took and the Tampa Bay defense was outstanding. Also, the Bucs are running a lot of plays for Antonio Brown that used to go to Chris Godwin, like the quick hitters and wide receiver screens. Also, Godwin terribly was missed by Brady on what easily could have been a 25-yard gain. I mean, even if you give Godwin that third catch, he still only has three catches for 50 yards, and that's simply not going to cut it. I mean, Tampa only had 303 total yards as a team and 196 total passing yards. When you have four viable targets, Evans, Godwin, a uh, Antonio Brown, Gronk, and then Scotty Miller accounts for 48 of the 196 total passing yards on the only big passing play of the game, then all Buccaneer pass catchers will disappoint unless they fall into the end zone. This has not been the 2003 St. Louis Rams 2.0 like many had hoped. Chiefs versus the Dolphins. Tua had his best fantasy output of the year, but he still made his fair share of rookie mistakes. He took a sack at the end of the half, which took the Dolphins out of field goal range, and he also took a sack later in the game that ended up being a safety. But he's improving in little ways. You know, he's kind of taking what's there for him, a little more uh, underneath passing. So there's certainly some optimism for 2021. One trend is that he likes targeting Mike Gesicki in the end zone. But Gesicki isn't getting much separation he simply uses his body size to get touchdowns. It's no surprise that Gesicki only plays about 50% of the snaps, 52 this week, because I just don't think he's an elite separator or a route runner. All right, Broncos versus the Panthers. KJ Hamler is a big play waiting to happen, which I've mentioned before, and it happened twice this week. But he only had three targets, so I'm tempering my expectations, but this is noteworthy. Also, Tim Patrick got yet another designed red zone target that led to a touchdown. So he's very involved when they get near the goal line. Texans versus the Bears. The Bears got to Deshaun Watson early with a lot of pressure, six total sacks, thereby preventing him from doing really anything. He was benched about midway through the third quarter with the game completely out of hand. I'm really sorry if he was your starter in the fantasy playoffs because you almost certainly lost. Meanwhile, the Bears also controlled the first half with their run game and short passes. Now, the Texans' defense isn't anything to write home about, but Mitch Trubisky started to take some risks by trusting his pass catchers to make plays. 
Perhaps a better defense would have made him pay for those risks, but the Bears offense looks competent lately uh, ever since Trubisky regained that role. Uh, Cardinals versus the Giants. Kyler and Hopkins looked healthier in this game, so it's no surprise that both performed well. For Kyler, he looked more mobile and less afraid to break the pocket, which resulted in 13 carries, which is much more in line with what we saw before the, sh the shoulder injury. Meanwhile, Hopkins was all over the field with a decent 99 total air yards. So he, he has a po much more positive outlook moving forward. By the way, Kyler's day was, I know it was a little disappointing, but it really should have been more. I mean, he threw a pass to Max Williams where he was tackled on the one inch, maybe the half inch line. And there was another goal line throw that was knocked away. So he very easily could have thrown three touchdowns. Cowboys versus the Bengals. The Bengals are totally in a tailspin, so there's really not much to learn from either team. I will note that Tony Pollard received nearly 50% of the carries and almost 40% of the running back snaps. I think he's a difference maker who should not be on your waiver wire. Only three of his touches were on the last drive of the game, so his involvement isn't completely the result of a blowout. I think he's a good handcuff to have on your team if he's still available. Colts versus the Raiders. We, we really need to talk about first impression bias. So what typically happens in a fantasy year is fantasy players make a lot of judgments based on the first week or the first few weeks of the season. Once a player establishes in the, themselves as something in week one or week two, we tend to think about that fantasy player being that way for the entire season, despite what we're seeing with our eyes. And I'm guilty of this too. Look, I had P.Y. Hilton in my starting lineup until probably about 12.58 p.m. on Sunday when I swapped him out for Kiki QT because Brandon Cooks was ruled out. I convinced myself that T.Y. Hilton's first half of the season was more true than what we've seen recently and that this T.Y. Houston thing was real where he always dominates the Houston Texans. But I screwed up due to this bias. And I'm not alone. Look, only 31% of fantasy players on Sleeper started T.Y. Hilton this week. Here's the truth. T.Y. Hilton is resurging. He's being used in the red zone, in the intermediate routes, and even a lot of downfield passes. And I think he looks healthier because he's getting a lot more separation than he did before. I think Hilton's passed Pittman on the, in targets and productions, even if he hasn't passed him in playing time. Pittman's still playing about 90% of the snaps compared to about 70 for Hilton. Again, I don't think it matters because Hilton is open and Rivers is looking his way. Jets versus the Seahawks. I know it's the Jets, but the Seahawks defense is much better than they were. The addition of Carlos Dunlop has done wonders. If you had the courage to pick them up in week 12, given their amazing upcoming schedule, good on you. Either way, fire them up next week against Washington, who's likely to be led by Dwayne Haskins. Packers versus the Lions. Stafford suffered a rib injury in this game, and this very well might end his season. Stafford's a tough cookie, but there really isn't much to play for in Detroit in 2020. Also, Stafford's future with the Lions team is already uncertain. Now that the coaching staff's been fired and the GM is gone, some people view him as a possible trade target or cut target. So I just don't envision Stafford risking his health for a team that's in so much flux. Losing Stafford downgrades all the Lions. We have no idea whether Kenny Galladay will return this season. You know, he's also been rather vocal about his desire for a new contract. So he may hold out for this season with nothing on the line and no new contract. TJ Hawkinson was having a breakout season and he got 11 targets in this game, but the move to Chase Daniels almost certainly decreases his ability to score with regularity, which you need from the tight end position. Uh, Falcons versus the Chargers. One of the more shocking statistics on the week is that Justin Herbert had the fourth lowest average depth of, char of target. This may have something to do with Mike Williams' injury or Bill Belichick still being in his head from last week, but still his deep passing ability was perhaps his best asset. So it's surprising to see. But then again, Anthony Lynn isn't the smartest coach. At least this short passing game is good news for Austin Eckler. Washington football team versus the 49ers. I told you before that I wanted to see a little more of Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk share the field. Well, we got to see it for five total quarters. Debo Samuel is injured again. Another hamstring injury, which probably sounds familiar to anyone who's had Samuel on their fantasy roster. He, the dude just can't stay healthy. Even in a small sample size, Brandon Ayuk is clearly the better wide receiver. 
He ex excels both as a route runner and as a playmaker. If Debo misses time, Ayuk assumes that sort of gimmicky role in addition to his typical route runner role. I know this offense isn't world changing, but Kyle Shanahan is a good enough coach that you can confidently start Ayuk anywhere. The Washington defense is really good, so Ayuk's 16 targets is particularly noteworthy. Saints versus Eagles. Jalen Hurts dramatically improved the Eagles defense. I didn't think he would be this great, but he did some big things. Of particular note, the Eagles started running the zone read quite a bit, which was effective for both Hurts and, more importantly, Miles Sanders. In fact, Sanders' 82-yard touchdown occurred off a zone read handoff. Sanders was also schemed heavily into this game, both in the passing game and the running game, likely because Doug Peterson watches this video and heard my criticisms last week. We've seen this before to the point where it's a trend. Mobile quarterbacks make running backs more effective. It happens in Baltimore. It's happened in other places as well. So it's certainly the case here for Sanders as well. I knew Hertz was mobile, but I was a bit worried about whether he'd be effective enough through the air to allow that running game efficiency to come to fruition. But he was quite usable as a passer, again, because he's mobile. The Philly O-line is rough, but Hertz was able to escape the pocket with his mobility, which led to 18 rushing attempts and 106 yards. I mean... Hertz probably was pushed from the pocket maybe 15, 20 times, maybe more. And yet he never took a sack. That's a big deal for this team. And it's a big deal for all the Philly pass catchers, particularly Goddard and also Sanders as a receiver. And to a lesser extent, Jalen Rager. I think you can ignore the Alshon Jeffrey touchdown. It was his only catch of the game. Now on the same side of the ball, I was very happy to see Alvin Kamara receive 10 targets. This was a symptom of two things. One, the Saints were actually in a close game for the first time in weeks. But more importantly, Sean Payton was clearly designing plays for Taysom Hill to get Kamara the ball through the passing game. Kamara got lined up wide. He ran some crossing routes. And uh, on those types of routes, uh, Hill hit him in stride because that's sort of the depth of, of pass that he's comfortable with. The touch pass di demons did return for Taysom Hill as he gunned to throw to Kamara on a design screen that turned into an its interception due to lack of touch. But Hill demonstrated some growth later on when he threw a nice touch pass to a uh, tight end on a screen. So maybe there's some hope, but still uh, I'm hoping for a week 15 return, regardless of how well Kamara performed this past week. Finally, the Steelers versus the Bills. The Steelers are one of the most pass-happy offenses in the league. Most of these passes are glorified running plays. Ben Roethlisberger has an average catch yards per attempt, C-A-Y, of 4.5 on the season, which is essentially the worst of all qualified passers. Only Jimmy Garoppolo, Alex Smith, and Dwayne Haskins rank lower, but none of them have played a full season. That number is actually getting worse, too. Over the first 10 games, Ben's CAY was 4.88, not exactly lighting the world on fire, but over the last three weeks, it's only 3.9. Ben is allegedly fighting a knee injury, which may be the cause of this conservative passing, uh, but an offense designed like this really hurts players like Chase Claypool and Deontay Johnson, and I think it also hurts James Conner, because here's what... what the Bills did and what's going to end up happening if they continue this offensive strategy. The Bills knew the Steelers lived and died on the short passing game, so they typically move all 11 players within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage and de defend against it, which completely exposed the Steelers' offense. If the Steelers can't take the top off of defense, defenses can play very aggressively, which is exactly what the Bills did. It was Great for the Bills. They destroyed the Steelers. I think other defense will try and emulate this based on Bill's, Bill's success. So either the Steelers have to adapt or they are going to see a decrease in offensive efficiency. All right. Thanks for watching. I'm Nate Henry. You can follow me on Twitter at NateHenryFF. I look forward to next week and good luck in your fantasy championships. Mm -hmm.